are so enthusiastic. <laughs> um, so I might have more slides than I can cover, so I'll just try to uh, go through everything, but I won't feel compelled to actually finish it if there are questions or clarifications that you want to ask. I much rather prefer spend time answering those. So please uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time. You don't even need to raise your hand, just ask the question, okay? Um, so my name is Alberto. I work here at MIT. I started about four years ago, and oh, they told me that I have to be around here so that uh, the mic uh, captures my voice. Um, I work in robotic manipulation, and today I'm going to give you sort of an overview of uh, fundamentals uh, of things that um, everyone should know in robot that everyone that works in robotic manipulation or outside should know. Um, but you should. Keep in mind that as any time that someone gives a talk like this about the fundamentals of something, uh, this is my perspective on the fundamentals, right? So uh, just um, remember that. Okay, so what's the game plan for, uh, for the talk? First, I'm going to talk a little bit about manipulation, um, what it is, um, and sort of give a perspective as we go from broad and hopeless problems that we would like to solve to solvable but very narrow problems that we can actually solve. Then um, I'll, I'll switch gears and talk um, a little bit of manipulation but from a mechanics perspective. So how do forces now come into play and how do we deal with them and how do we uh, model a couple example problems from uh, the ground up uh, so that we can um, study the mechanics of those tasks and then maybe do planning or control with, the, with those uh, uh, with, with the algebraic expressions of the mechanics of those problems. I've, I've been told that you've heard a lot about planning frameworks and different ways to think about planning. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about here actually leverages planning algorithms, right? But I'm going to give you a perspective from manipulation, uh, how tasks like grasping um, or inserting an object, for example, uh, can be modeled or can be solved with planning algorithms. <clears throat> okay, so what is manipulation? Um, classically, well, industrial robotic manipulation uh, many decades ago um, started, or even today to a uh, to, to large degree, uh, it's focused on uh, picking up objects and moving them maybe one, uh, one at a time, right? So I wanna pick up this object, and I want to put it here because here is inside the box or here is inside the shelf or here is in a tray that is going to go to the next place, right? So this is for the most part what robots are used uh, or have been used for decades. Okay, so it doesn't escape anyone that this is a very narrow description of what manipulation could be, right? If you look at what we do with our hands, it's like very, very broad, right? It's almost impossible or very difficult to describe what is it that we do when we shuffle uh, cards or uh, any of these tasks like involving cooking or cutting or using tools uh, origami I don't know peeling uh, many things that we do with our hands right that are essential to the way we relate to the world but um, sort of if we try to approach manipulation from that perspective right the kind of things that we can do then it becomes hopeless it becomes too broad um, so, um, the, the story of how robotics research has been looking at uh, manipulation problems, uh, or at least the way I want to, uh, I like explaining it, is that we've been sort of going down the ladder, half jokingly, I call it the ladder of shame, into simpler and simpler problems until we get to a problem that we can actually model, that we can actually solve, right? So. You think about putting it, uh, putting on a jacket, right? So that's like the, the what I would say the extreme of the manipulation problem, right? I don't even know what a jacket is from an algebraic perspective, right? Like what is the state of a jacket? What does it mean to apply forces to the jacket? Um, at, like it's it's hopeless to try to model it uh, from a mechanics perspective. Okay, so we sort of go down to problems that are a bit more structured, right? So there are problems that might still be very difficult to model from a mechanics perspective, but at least there's a clear connection between action and effect, right? So I cut something so it just breaks down into two parts. 
or I bend something because I want to have a very particular reaction. Um, those are might be ac um, actions that are still very difficult to model, so um, that's still very difficult to solve from a robotics perspective. So we go down what I would call parameterized manipulation, right? So these are tasks for which now we have more clear uh, representations of the state, right? So you have a door uh, and there's a hinge at the door so I can assign an, an angle to the door. So I have a, a space where I can represent the state of the world and a space where I can do planning, for example, right? Um, parameterized manipulation. This is still quite difficult to solve today. So we say, okay, just forget about actually opening the valve or opening the door, let's just focus on grasping the valve, right? So let's just like, for at least uh, to be able to operate the valve, I need to grasp it first. So let's try to focus on that problem. Um, and by grasping, I mean the dynamic process by which the end effector, my hand, it reaches out into the environment and deals with whatever comes in the way and then achieves a functional grasp to be able to execute um, the, the particular uh, action. Well, it turns out that that is still a very difficult problem to solve, which we haven't tackled almost, uh, uh, almost never. Um, and most of the research that has actually been transitioned to practical research involves grasp, right, without even the ING, right? So just a static analysis of what is a good set of forces uh, on the boundary of an object that gives me nice properties uh, for immobilization, for example. I'm holding this bottle and I know the weight, so I know that I have enough friction so that the bottle won't fall, for example, if I move fast. Um, we wanna be here, right? But we're sort of like close to this end of the spectrum of the manipulation ladder. Um, okay, so um, just to give you a lot of the research like many decades ago or uh, focused on this area of manipulation. Um, but even today, like very recent approaches sort of focused on this particular problem, right? And just to sort of motivate the beginning of the talk, I'm gonna give you an overview of, uh, you, many, many of you might know, the Amazon Robotics Challenge. Um, there's a challenge that Amazon put together for the last three years sort of to foster developments precisely in that problem, right? So the problem of, I want a robot to be able to pick up an object from a tray full of objects and then putting it somewhere else, in a, in a shelf, for example, or in a cardboard box. Um, okay, so you've probably seen these pictures, warehouses filled with uh, thousands, millions of objects, and um, sort of to sort of focus or narrow down the challenge, what Amazon said, okay, we're gonna start from having a tote filled with objects, which the robot might not have seen before, and the task would be the robot has to pick up uh, all of those objects and identify them correctly and, um, and then sort them and put them in storage, for example. Okay, so how do you approach that problem? Well, you need a robot and you need a gripper and you need a perception system and then you need a planner and then you need a cognition system, right, that uh, sort of at the task level decides what to do at every stage. Um, the task has certain uh, challenges like the robot has to be able to navigate in the environment without making collisions, and it has to deal with clutter, right? There are objects under other objects uh, or in between, and there's large object variability, uh, which means that the robot has to be able to pick up things that are rigid or things that are soft or things that are long or things that are small uh, with very different materials. Um, okay, this is the gripper that we used. Um, it's a combination of a suction cup and a parallel jog, uh, gripper with force control and with a spatula so that we can get in, in between spaces. Um, okay, so one of the big challenges, like even today when you try to build a system like this, and uh, this is something that every team had to face, right, is that we still don't have um, um, planners that can generate the good, good proposals to grasp objects uh, that the robot has never seen before, especially when, there's, when they are in clutter and when there's such wide variability. For example, you see an, an image like this and the robot has to, has to decide, well, if I, if I wanna pick up this cup here, 
Uh, maybe I should do it with the gripper in this orientation, or maybe I should use the suction cup, I don't know. So the robot has to decide on its own. And the second problem is identifying the object. So the robot picks up one object and then it has never seen it before. The only thing that it has is maybe product images from the internet. Uh, and it has to identify that this is the correct one. It's not any of these. Okay, so a very standard approach of how these systems work today, right? Um, you get input images to the system. So could be RGB or depth images or a combination of both. And then rather than um, uh, using geometric, uh, a geometric understanding of the environment and a geometric understanding of the uh, um, uh, frictional interaction between the gripper and the, uh, and the object that we want to pick up, we, we instead train um, neural networks, we train um, um, machine learning algorithms to be able to suggest like what would be a good approach direction to pick up uh, the object, even without knowing what object, uh, what that object is, right? So these neural networks, they get an image and they output a height map suggesting that um, if you go to pick up over here or if you go to pick up over there with the suction cup, it's gonna, it will likely succeed. But uh, <clears throat> if you decide to use the gripper, then this is the corresponding height map. Okay, so this would be the equivalent of a perception system, but nowadays with uh, convolutional neural networks, and then the task of the planner is to decide, oh, from all the things that I could execute, which one is the most likely to succeed? Well, it looks like this is the highest point, which corresponds to this grasp, and the robot goes, executes it, and picks up the whisker from the handle, which, by the way, is an object that it has never seen before. Um, why does it do that? Well, we don't know, right? It's a neural network, but it probably has succeeded before in uh, picking up things that are elongated and that, that are thin. So it has some of some and, uh, basic understanding of the affordances of each one of the actions that it can execute, right? It knows how to grasp and it knows how to do suction and it has an idea of what is the appearance of the objects that are graspable or suctionable. Yeah. Say a bit more about how you're about yep. Yep. Uh, so, um, in this case, uh, the the likelihood of succeeding. Uh, so the the space of actions is parameterized by the image, um, which means every pixel in the image corresponds. Every pixel and every orientation in the image corresponds to one action. So it means going to grasp here with this orientation or going to grasp there with this orientation. And then what the neural networks output is a height map of what is the likelihood of success um, for each one of those actions, right? And these are trained uh, offline with multiple uh, examples, right? So what we did is we went to Target and we bought 200 objects and we filled 500 beans with different arrangements of objects. And then we just told the robot painfully what it would make sense to grasp and what it would make it would not make sense to grasp and then we spent four days doing that and then sort of over time it learned uh, to generate these maps of the likelihood of success um, yep So uh, we've done like both approach, uh, several approaches. In this particular case, what we did for the challenge, um, it was just uh, human supervision. So we, the human would say, these are regions of grasps that are likely to succeed, and the robot would just trust it. And these are regions of grasps that are not likely to succeed, and the robot would just trust it without actually trying it. Um, we've done a combination of both since then. But what we did for these particular videos for the challenge was just direct human supervision. And I'm going a, a little bit fast through this because this is supposed to be just motivation for uh, uh, explaining why this doesn't work, right? But, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Yep. 
Yeah, so we bought 200 objects and we filled 500 totes like that one with a uh, different amount of objects. And then for each tote, we gave, um, I forgot the exact number, in the order of like 20 labels of things that would be make sense to grasp and things that would not make sense to grasp. No, not not whole trajectory, and I'll, I'll go to get uh, I'll go to that uh, very very soon. Um, this is um, just grasp. Re remember, this is not grasping, right? So this is just where should the robot put the gripper, or where should the robot put the suction cup? So these systems don't know much about what is a good approach direction to. I don't know, make space for itself and then go under an object, for example, because it makes sense to grasp it that way, right? This is just trained on where should you put your gripper and then close it and with what orientation. Okay? And this is, by the way, how all of these systems that you might see today in videos um, uh, are working, right? This is completely open loop and just uh, visually accessible grasps. But um, to some degree, it works to a certain uh, per, uh, level of performance, right? Uh, so the second stage is, well, you pick up the object and then you want to certify which, ob which one of these objects this is. And then, again, we train a neural network to match images of objects in the gripper to product images. And, um, and then we select which one of these uh, is the right object by minimizing the distance in, uh, in a space that we learn um, to, um, to project both images and product images. Okay, so the idea is you build all of that, a system based on detecting grasp locations, right? What it would make sense to grasp an object. And then you put it together and it sort of works. It makes mistakes sometimes, uh, but if you sort of give it enough feedback of when it uh, fails, um, it succeeds at emptying uh, all of the objects and identify them correctly um, over time. This is, by the way, 15x. So it's quite slow. Still was the fastest in the challenge. Um, okay, so you put this together and uh, we sort of got the, the first prize on that task, and you're all happy, and then you pack, you go back home, right? And then you sleep maybe for a week because you haven't been able to sleep in the last uh, couple months. Uh, but then after that week, right, when you recover some of the neurons and some of the mental space, you start thinking, okay, um, what, was it, what was working and what was not working, right? Like, what did the, this system work and when was it failing and when it was failing, why was it, why was the case? Well, um, our system and most of the systems today sort of are based on, <clears throat> as I was saying, visibly accessible grasps, right? So I see and I identify a location where I can put my gripper and then the robot closes its eyes and then executes the action open loop, right? And um, you can fine tune a system like that if, you, if it's well calibrated uh, to work to a certain degree of performance. But again, it doesn't escape to most of us that that's not how we roll, right? That's not how we grasp things. I, I don't even know precisely where this bottle is, right? I just fill it and maybe it falls, but it's okay, right? I just pick it up. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the act or the uh, the art of picking up things is more of a dynamic process than a static uh, open loop execution. Um, so my two favorite like types of failure modes of systems like this um, are these ones. The first one, uh, well, this object like this looks like a perfectly graspable thing, right? I, it's a very flat surface and there's no clutter around it. Uh, so the neural network knows that if there's something that is flat uh, and um, with sort of plastic kind of looking material, there's probably going to be a good suction latch. 
and there's no clutter around it, so why wouldn't it just go there and pick up that object? Well, I mean, it has no notion, it has no understanding of geometry, right? It doesn't understand that there are other objects on top, and that if this is a binder, probably a significant part of the binder is under all those objects, and you probably want to pick up these ones on top first before you pick up the binder, or you want to grab the binder and pull it and junk it out. Um, so what about planning? Right? What about planning a sequence of actions uh, that lead the gripper into a good grasp, not just uh, a static uh, configuration? And the second one, um, sometimes the robot would pick up an object which looks like a perfectly good grasp from the perspective of the phalanges of the gripper, but it's clearly not ideal, right? Like this is a very marginal grasp, and if the robot were to accelerate, it would just whew, fly away. Um, and the robot doesn't know anything about it, right? It's completely agnostic to what is happening while it's picking up the object because it doesn't have uh, the, right, uh, the right kind of feedback. And even if it were to have that feedback, it wouldn't know how to use it, right? It wouldn't know how to control uh, and uh, adjust the grasp. Okay, so we've forgotten all or most about physics and geometry and consequently uh, our ability to plan or control these operations. Um, okay, so sort of to step back and to more crisply uh, explain what I mean by grasping, right, by what I mean by a dynamic process, I'll use my favorite example. So you have uh, Geometry and the Imagination, uh, the book in a shelf, and you want to pick it up. What is the accessible grasp of this book here, right? How do you tell, how does the robot figure out how to pick up that, that book? Uh, there are no accessible grasps, right? Because there's a wall on the other side, and because if I use suction over here, it will just fling open the book, and it would just fail, right? Instead, for us, it's like extremely intuitive. Um, I just put my hand, I slide the book, and then I, uh, with, uh, with a fast motion, I put the thumb on the other side, and then, then is when I have the grasp, right? This is what we want, this is what uh, we've been working on for so many years, figuring out how the robot can reach this grasp. But to be able to get here uh, in a realistic fashion, we have to plan the entire sequence. We have to get the robots to be able to have enough understanding of the, um, um, the physics of interaction to realize that, well, to be able to pull the book backwards, first I need to exert a force normal to the book, right? So, like that's sort of kind of anti anti intuitive to the to the robot, right? So I need to move the book backwards. So I want to exert a force backwards, but for that I need to exert enough normal force so that I can have enough frictional force to pull it backwards, right? So how do we get robots to sort of develop that understanding? Um, to me, that's sort of what defines the manipulation problem, right? How do we get robots to do this? Um, to figure out um, the mechanics of this process, but also the planning aspects and the execution aspects and the intelligent aspect, the cognition aspects of uh, sequencing these actions. Um, so to do that, we need contact and friction, right? So control authority is modulated by friction in, uh, for the most part in manipulation. So Inevitably, uh, if you want to uh, come up with dexterous actions like this, you need to reason about friction. Um, you also need to have a layer of planning, right? You can't do this unless you sequence different manipulation stages, touching and sliding and then grasping. And finally, you need sensing and control, right? So a lot of these actions are quite noisy, right? We don't have a good model for the pressure distribution or the friction pattern between the hand and the book. So whatever models you have of that interaction, they're going to be pretty poor. Um, they, has, they have to be just good enough so that then you can control and replan and execute in a, a reliable fashion. OK. So and uh, those things is what I think, like at least to go one level up in, uh, from a mechanics perspective, um, it's necessary. Okay, so now it's where I sort of get to the second part of the talk. Uh, remember there are three parts. 
And I sort of want to have the same conversation, uh, what is manipulation, but now from a mechanics perspective. Um, this is where my bias comes into place, right? Um, how do we think about problems like this, but now also within the language of forces and friction? Um, OK, so um, of course, when you want to talk about forces, you need to start using uh, equations of motion, right? Um, who knows what this equation is, or who doesn't know who, what this equation is? As this is just Newton's equation, right? Mass times acceleration. Q is the state of the system, or let's say the state of the object um, that you want to control. Mass times acceleration equal the sum of forces. There are dynamic forces like Coriolis or Euler or um, um, Corio and centripetal. And then there's gravity, and then there are uh, contact forces, right? So the, ac the uh, actions that, that I can, sorry, the uh, effects that I can exert on the object, these accelerations, are sort of modulated by these forces that are, are, that are acting on it, right? And what I really have control over, if I want to, are these contact forces, right? So from a mechanics perspective, manipulation is that thing you gain when you add contact forces here or when you think about these contact forces as your control inputs, right? I can push because I have a contact normal force and frictional force, and those become my uh, control inputs. Uh, so how do we embrace these contact forces to manipulate an object? Um, okay, so to do that from an algebraic perspective, sort of the standard way in which we model these problems in robotic manipulation is by having models for these forces, right? So we need models for which contact forces can be exerted with a particular type of end effector. I mean, am I going to model the interaction between my end effector and the object as point contacts, or patch contacts, or large surface contacts, or soft contacts? And each one of those types of contacts is going to have a model that explains or characterizes which forces I can exert which forces I have uh, authority over. Um, and, yeah. So you would also assume the whole of the object? Know yeah. This is a uh, um, I know everything world, right? So this is a world where I have models for everything, and then I try to reason about what is it that I should do so that my model of everything uh, behaves the way that I would like it to behave. Um, and I'll, I'll work, we will work through a couple examples of all of these uh, in the third part of the talk, okay? So we need models for the contact forces. We need models for kinematic constraints, right? So am I going to assume that the objects that I am manipulating are rigid so that I need to make sure that in my models the, um, the equations don't allow things to penetrate each other? Or am I going to assume that they are deformable? So my models should account and model that deformation of the objects. Um, and then interaction principles, right? So um, friction laws or restitution laws. If I throw something and it bounces, how much energy is it going to uh, maintain after bouncing? Um, um, maximal dissipation. Um, things sort of try to move, trying to maximize the dissipation through friction, for example. I have some principles, and then I use. And then each one of these things we will see will become constraints that will be added to Newton's equation. And all of these will define a system of equations that I will need to solve to figure out what the system is doing if I apply a certain force, or which force I need to apply if I know what I want the system to do. Right? Um, things Scott gave at hog. Um, sometime. Um, when, when did Scott give his talk? Scott? Tuesday. Tuesday. So he probably used the same kind of language of forces and constraints, right? Same kind of formalism. Um, and this is widely used, sort of, this approach is widely used for modeling or simulation. Like if you look, if you use uh, a rigid body simulator, this is the way that interactions are modeled, right? You have to specify um, 
particular types of models for contact forces and kinematic constraints and interaction principles. And you should be aware of which types of models that simulator is using so that you understand the type of behavior you get out of the simulator. Um, planning, control, state estimation, you name it. Okay, however, um, this type of formulation, we will see that it leads to a certain degree of complexity, algebraic complexity, um, computational issues. For example, under actuation, um, if I exert certain forces, there are forces through, through friction and contact, there are forces that I cannot exert, right? So I can only push, but I cannot pull through contact, right? So that will mean that my uh, control authority will be constrained uh, to certain um, um, a set of forces depending on the types of contacts that I have. Um, hybridness, like I can grasp an object or I can push it or I can slide my fingers and it's very difficult to explain all of those behaviors with the same uh, consistent set of equations. Um, it's, the models are noisy. So a lot of uh, set of complexities. Hence, the story of the mechanics of robotic manipulation is the story of uh, finding simplifications, right? Finding approximation and assumptions that make the algebra of these equations simpler to solve from a computational perspective. And um, sort of what I want to show now is sort of a, a nice description. This is sort of this taxonomy comes from Matt Mason, Matt Mason's book on the mechanics of manipulation, uh, which sort of lays down a sequence of types of uh, manipulation problems that become more and more complex depending on the type of task dynamics that you consider or the, the level of approximation or simplifications you make to the dynamics. The first one is a static manipulation, right? So static manipulation means that um, whatever object that I'm manipulating is static, right? So there's no motion. Uh, this is where grasping, no, not grasping, sorry, but grasp falls, right? Um, there's force balance. There's no forces in the system that they balance each other, and there's no motion. So the question of motion just becomes gravity gets compensated by all contact forces. Um, this is where classically we study the notions of force balance and stability, um, things like grasp analysis, right? So. I get a set of contacts. This is sort of the most classical work, I would say, from the grasping uh, community. I said that I have a set of contacts on, an on the boundary of an object, and I have a model for which forces can be transmitted through each one of those contacts, and you have to give me the answer as to whether this is a good enough grasp or not, right? Is this grasp gonna be stable uh, against external disturbances? Uh, or grasp synthesis now is the opposite. I give you the geometry. Um, this is an image from Graspit, a very uh, a widely used simulator for grasping. Um, you give me the 3D geometry of the object, and now your task is to find where should I put the fingers of my, now my well-defined gripper, right? So my, the fingers of my gripper cannot move arbitrarily in space, but they are constrained. Where should I put them so that I get a good grasp? or things like stability and the gravity. If I throw this object, it's never gonna fall like this, right? It's gonna fall on under sort of some set of stable uh, configurations. So all these are sort of classical lines of research that fall under, under static manipulation. Okay, so we go one step further, and now it's what we call quasi-static manipulation, where we still have force balance, but, um, there's the possibility of motion, right? So I'm moving the object, but the motion is slow enough that there are no inertial effects, right? So there's always force balance. The frictional forces and gravity and the contact forces always balance each other. Um, this is sort of the classical lines of work in, these, in this area are like pushing, right? I'm pushing an object and uh, the, friction, the, the friction between the ground and the object and the forces that I'm exerting on it, they balance each other. But it just happens that I'm exerting just enough to be on the edge of the friction cone, and then I can 
sort of direct the, the position of the object uh, quasi statically. And uh, we we'll look at this particular problem uh, a little bit later. Um, and dextrose manipulation. Um, the, the kind of dextrose manipulation where uh, at, the, at the, its origins, where it assumed that fingers would never slip on the object, but they would just roll these kind of motions. This is also an expression of quasi-static manipulation, right? Gravity is always balanced by um, the contact forces. It's uh, rather inefficient of manipulating an object, right? So we just, we always do much more dynamic actions where things are sliding, uh, but you can also model in hand manipulation with this kind of motion where contacts are always rolling. Um, okay, so that's one step. The next step is what we call quasi-dynamic manipulation, where now motions are still slow, but now there's not necessarily force balance. Sometimes there's not enough friction in my contacts and uh, things are falling. Gravity uh, goes, is larger than my friction forces. And then the object actually is sliding down by the action of gravity, right? And uh, that's what we call quasi-dynamic manipulation. It's still not dynamic in the sense that the inertial terms are very small, right? So friction dominates over the inertial terms. So you don't really need to remember what is the velocity of the object because the velocity of the object is almost zero all the time. Um, but there's no force balance. And um, classic works in this domain are things like lifting an object from the ground. Um, things have to slide on the finger, right? So there has to be some positive, um, uh, there has to be, uh, the, f the resultant of forces has to be different than zero to be able to do that. Um, or we will also look at this example, at this problem later on, um, manipulating an object, but when the contacts are sliding. So you get, you get a little bit more dexterity um, out of the type of contact interactions. Okay, static, quasi-static, quasi-dynamic, and finally dynamic manipulation, right? So now everything in the equation of motion, everything in Newton's equation is there, right? You have to consider every single term here. Also, the terms that are inertial, right? The inertial forces, the terms that show up because the system has certain velocity and certain tendency to move, right? Um, classical works here, throwing and catching, right? Or dynamic throwing, for example, where you need to generate a certain velocity downward so that then you can throw it uh, forward. Right? To be able to solve these problems, you need to consider all the terms in the equation of motion, and consequently, computationally, is much more complex. Okay, um, so now I can stop for a little bit if you want, if you have any questions, but the, well, the idea is to now start into the, the, the last and maybe larger part of the talk where we will work through two of these examples from a mechanics perspective and sort of build up all the constraints and equations that are necessary to model those examples. But before that, do you have any questions? Yep. Yep. So, um, so there's uh, different levels of complexity depending on the problem that you wanna that you wanna solve. So, if you're aiming for planning, sort of the geometry of the object becomes um, a hurdle because you sort of there are um, many different things that you can do depending on the geometry. For simulation, for example, it also makes it more complicated. But because it's simply an exercise of forward integration, sort of the geometry, uh, the, what it affects is where the contact forces will happen, and that's something that can be resolved. So if you look at uh, rigid body simulators, um, they use these type of equations, but you can input any 3D mesh that you want, right? And it will solve these equations in real time. 
uh, if, it, if it's necessary. To be able to do planning, for example, it's more complex, right? If you want to do trajectory optimization, um, you will see that a lot of algorithms work with convex objects, for example, because it's easier to compute distances or it's easier to model when things will become in contact or what is the distance between them. Um, while if you have a very complex object, then it's more complicated. Another classical limitation is if you have objects that are compliant, right? You can have a model for the compliance, right? You can have a model that explains that if I apply this amount of force, it will deform in a certain way. And that will have a significant impact on my ability to exert forces, right? So if the contacts deform and become concave, the grass becomes more stable, right? And I have more control authority. But you need a model that explains those things, right? And you need a model that you compute over to explain those things. Um, so computationally becomes more, uh, more problematic. There's a wealth of approaches, like um, finite element would be sort of at one extreme where you want to have more accuracy of the deformation of the model. Um, but that's finite element method is something that even for simulation is very slow, right? So if you were to want to plan or do trajectory optimization with a model like that, it becomes prohibitive, right? Um, so there are lower dimensional models of compliance, for example that things that form in sort of like, instead of having like a million springs connected between each one of the particles of the finite element method, you have a much lower dimensional representation of how things can deform. Yep? To what extent do you think that this is similar to how humans manipulate movies or these situations? Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I probably, I'm probably not the, uh, the first person to answer or to give uh, an, um, an academic answer to that question, but I can give my perspective, right? Um, I think that uh, humans don't go all the way to uh, simulating these, these type of equations accurately. Um, one, because... Um, it's very difficult to do it. And second, because it's probably not necessary to do many of these things, right? So you will see later that, well, if you add a, la a layer of control, for example, the models that you use to explain the mechanics can be approximate. You can have, you can use quasi a quasi-static model, for example, um, with actions that are dynamic, but as long as you control it, as long as you replan fast enough, um, you can get away with it. Um, and, um, but I do think that there's some level of notion or intuition of um, things that have to do with um, intuitive physics, right? So something that is more massive or something that is less massive will behave differently. Something that is more massive, I need to exert more force. How do I know that, right? How do I adjust the force that I need to exert to lift this object? Well, I mean, Maybe the representation we have doesn't have written in, in words mass or force, but it's gonna be a proxy for that, right? So there's gonna be a relationship between how heavy I expect an object to be and how much force I'm gonna do to lift it. Uh, or how heavy an object is, or how far I wanna throw an object and how much force I'm gonna exert to throw it, right? So there's gonna be relationships like that that codify physics. Uh, maybe not the same way, but in some functional form. Yep. Yep. For the challenge? So for the challenge, it was static manipulation or even above that, right? So um, so the, for the challenge, if you remember, we were just telling the robot what is a good grasp, right? Where, where, it should it, where should it put its fingers and close with the expectation that that will lead to a stable grasp. But we never told the robot that to pick up that particular object, it should um, 
sort of go down and slide under the object and then grasp it, right? Or like, the example of the book, or pull the book backwards and then grasp it. In the challenge, it was purely open loop execution and purely vision based uh, or visual accessible grasps, right? So there was no planning of this sort. Um, I'll show now two examples where these come into place. What I would like to do is to be able to solve the challenge, but with an understanding of the dynamic process of grasping, right? So if I want to pick up an object in clutter, I need to make space for myself to get under the object and then lift it. But I don't know how to solve that problem. Um, I think no one knows how to solve the problem. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you, right? So um, this is like the way we operate is not in an open loop fashion in the sense that I have a model and then I just execute whatever my model tells me. Like it's a reactive process where I have sensors that give me information about the world and then I use that information somehow to change the way I, I behave, right? And someone might say, well, maybe it's a model-based I use that information in a model-based fashion, right? So I leave this object and I, I use the, the information of how much effort it takes me to lift it to make an estimate of the mass of the object. And then I use that estimate to do other things with it. Or simply I use it in a more reactive fashion, right? So um, in a PID loop fashion, right? So I'm exerting a certain amount of force and it's not going up, so I'm just gonna do a bit more force. And I don't have a model of the mass inside my brain. But it's, it's clear, whatever that is, it's clear that there's a reactive loop. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of mention it uh, soon, that that's sort of essential to, to be able to execute these actions in, uh, in a reliable way. Because the models that we have, they're gonna be noisy no matter what we do, right? Uh, they're gonna be defective or deficient uh, or just partial. Um, Yep. So, um, like, there are different ways to, um, on different kinds of assumptions that you can do or that people have done. And um, most of the work that you will find along these lines <coughs> assumes rigid objects, for example, right? So that the shape doesn't change, it's rigid. But there's also work that sort of starts to add a layer of compliance to the object and actively plans how to deal with it. Uh, so it's, it's your choice of how complicated you want to make this model, right? We can, ex we can, we can explain how the world works by, by using Newton, right? That's one thing we know about the world, uh, unless you go to relativistic arguments, right? That there are contact forces and we can, exert, we can explain the motion in the world by using Newton's equation, right? It's a matter of how deeply you want to go in the actual model of the object you are manipulating um, that will explain better or worse what is happening, right? So if you go to a finite element method, it will be pretty good at predicting what's going to happen. But then it becomes computationally very difficult to use it for planning, for example. Right? So it's the history of finding simplifications so that sort of the mechanics and the computational aspects are balanced, right? So you wanna be realistic, but at the same time, you also wanna be realistic from a computational perspective, right? Okay, any more questions? How much time do I have? You have 35 minutes. 35 minutes, okay, looks good. So we're gonna start with the first problem, which is the um, pusher slider system. Pusher slider system, um, it's sort of, 
um, a minimalistic problem in robotic manipulation. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by minimalistic in a second. But the idea is that you have an object that is flat and it's laying on a surface and then your, uh, your end effect or your actuator is just one point pusher, right? You have a poker that can push the object and the goal is to control the position of this object. Now, our goal now will be to build uh, the mechanics of a system like this. How many constraints, how many equations do we need to be able to explain this type of interaction? Um, I call it the simplest manipulation problem, or at least the simplest but still interesting manipulation problem, uh, sort of analogous to the inverted pendulum. Right, so the inverted pendulum is interesting from a controls perspective because, well, it's um, unstable and it's minimal in some sense, right? So you wanna control the position and orientation of this bar, but you only have an actuator that moves laterally. So you wanna use that um, to be able to control this under-actuated system. Um, and, um, if you think about it, this pusher slider system is kind of very similar to the inverted pendulum, except that uh, the forces that you're exerting on the object are modulated through friction, right? Instead of having a direct coupling here between this lateral actuator and this rotational bar, you have friction here. And friction will make it so that sometimes this will be a coupler, right? So it will be sticking to the object and it, it will just rotate. Sometimes it will slide. Uh, so it's a problem that is underactuated, which means that I cannot exert forces directly to the center of mass of the object, and uh, I cannot exert all the forces that I would like, right? So um, I want to bring it backwards, but if I'm here, I, I have no other way than having to go all the way to the back and bring it here. So instantaneously, I don't have full authority as to how the object should move. And it's hybrid. Hybrid meaning that uh, sometimes the poker will stick to the object and that will be explained with a set of algebraic equations. And sometimes it will be sliding on the object and that will, will be explained with another set of algebraic equations, right? So Coulomb's friction law behaves differently when you are inside what we call the friction cone or when you are in the boundary of the friction cone. And it's kind of noisy, right? It's difficult to observe. It's difficult to observe because the real mechanics of this problem is dependent on the pressure distribution between the object and the ground and the, the fibers of this plywood and what is the friction map between those two objects, um, which is something that we will never be able to see, right? Um, so we just have like a very weak or approximate model of that the interaction. So we will build a model that is deterministic, right? So, and we will aim to switch to a particular mode, right? Sometimes I wanna go to the other side of the object to push it here, and that will be deliberate planning, right? So I wanna slide so that then I can stick. Um, in practice, what will happen is that the models that I have are just approximate. So what might happen is might not be what I want it to happen, and then I'll have to react to it. Right? So first we will work through the mechanics. How do we model this system? If we knew how it works, right, if uh, under certain assumptions, and then we will see how to use that model in a co from a controls perspective, right, so that it can react to unexpected uh, unmodeled dynamics. Okay, um, the same challenges, but now casted on this problem, right? So I said it's underactuated. Well, there's a limited set of forces. I put the hand on the book and um, I cannot directly pull it backwards unless I'm exerting a normal force, right? And I cannot separate it from the world because I cannot go to the other side. So it's a system for which I don't have full authority. Um, which means in practice, this is sort of like the consequence from a planning perspective, is that I will need a planning horizon, right? So if I wanna control the book, I need to plan actions that are not instantaneous but that have a certain horizon. First I need to slide the book and then I have to grasp it. 
Um, there's hybridness, right? So if you look, this is actually my hand. I recorded myself. And if you look like frame by frame, uh, there are lots of things that are happening, right? So the fingers, like you, don't, you might not do it consciously, but the fingers sometimes they stick because you want the thing to slide, and sometimes they slide because you want sort of do a gentle motion of the finger, to the thumb to the other side, and then you squeeze, and then you have like a closed, uh, firm grasp on the object. On th all of those are hybrid uh, transitions of the behavior of the manipulator. So in practice, this will mean that the kind of planning problem that we will have to solve is not just continuous, but is also combinatorial, right? So we will need to search um, through the different types of behaviors that, um, that we want to execute. Should I first grasp and then slide, or should I first slide and then grasp, right? It's very intuitive to us, but for the robot, it makes no difference, right? Unless it builds some kind of intuition. And then it's weakly observed, as I was saying, right? The pressure distribution, the texture of the book, the deformation of my hand, all of these are things that matter for the mechanics, but that I'll probably never get to observe, or I'll have very, very uh, approximate models. So. It's going to be, to some degree, stochastic, right? There's going to be a certain level of stochasticity in the, in, the, in the problem. OK, so now from a mechanics perspective, right? So now we're sort of white means I know everything world. Um, it's a square, and I have a pusher. And um, this is, we're going to model it as a quasi-static uh, system, which means that there's gonna, we're going to assume that there's force balance. So the pushes that I'm exerting on the object are kind of slow so that it doesn't build momentum, um, which means that there's always going to be force balance between the force that the ground is exerting on the object, the frictional force, and the pushing force that the uh, poker is exerting on the object. There's going to be two forces here, the normal and then the friction. And uh, the normal and the friction will be related to each other uh, through frictions uh, through Coulomb's friction law. OK, so how many? what are the equations that we need to add to a system like this to be able to explain it and, for example, simulate it forward? First one is Newton's equation, right? So um, we're going to make a quasi-static assumption. So there's no acceleration. There's just um, the, uh, the force from the ground is going to be equal to the force from the pusher, or the range in this case, right? These are forces and torques. Now, we need to impose fric uh, Coulomb's friction law. And this is where things start getting a bit complicated because there are three modes. As I, we were saying, the pusher can be inside what we call the friction cone, um, where the friction force that we're trying to exert is uh, small enough so that the normal force we're exerting allows us to exert that friction force. So this will induce a kinematic constraint. So the, op the pusher will be stuck at that point to the object. So we will have this velocity constraint, the rel relative velocity between each other in the tangential direction is going to be zero. And then the forces will be resolved automatically to make sure that this is the case. But it can also be the case that we're trying to exert too much friction force, um, more friction force than what the contact allows us, right? So I'm here, and I'm applying friction force. And as long as I'm inside the friction cone, it will, get, it will be st uh, static there. But if I apply more force than what the friction force allows me, it will start to slide. And what Coulomb's friction law says is that the moment it starts sliding, then the force will be uh, limited by this friction cone. Right? So this becomes now a force constraint instead of a kinematic constraint. The force will be determined, either the maximum or the minimum up or down of this cone. And the velocity now will be, will be resolved by these forces. How much it slides? Well, it will depend on, um, on the type of, inter on the motion that the pusher is doing. So there are three different modes that are represented by three different uh, constraints. Either it's sticking, and we use this constraint, 
or it's sliding up and we use this constraint, or it's sliding down and we use this constraint. And which constraint you use is both a function of the motion of the pusher, but also is your choice, right? You can choose, you have control authority as to say, now I want the pusher to stick, or now I want the pusher to slide. Uh, so that deciding whether you want to be here, or here, or here, will become uh, uh, the job of the planner at every instant to decide if you want the pusher to stick or slide up or down. Okay, then we need to model, we need a model for the friction between the object and the ground. And um, while in this case we have a point contact and that is modeled with this friction cone, with Coulomb's friction cone, uh, when you have a patch contact, a standard way of modeling it is by integrating, assuming that you have an infinite number of point contacts at each one of the, uh, in the entire area, and then you integrate over all the friction forces that each one of those points are exerting. And then when you do that integration, you get the resultant of friction uh, between the ground and the object, a friction force and friction uh, torque, so a friction range. And a standard way, a common way to represent that friction range, uh, equivalent to the friction cone, is that now instead of a cone, we have a, a, an ellipse that says, if the force that you're trying to exert between the object and the ground is inside this ellipse, the object will stick to the ground. The moment you try to exert a force that goes beyond this ellipse, right, this is uh, two forces and torque, then the object will start to slide and the force will be on the boundary of the ellipse, right? So this is sort of the equivalent of this friction cone, but for patch contacts in 3D, standard way. And then there are ways to approximate it, like you can express it, you can approximate it by a, uh, an ellipse or, you can, or, for, or by a higher order um, um, polynomial terms. Yep. Patch contact. Patch contact, I mean that the contact is not a point, it's, but rather it's, a, it's a, an extended, it's a plane, but it's a portion of a plane. Right? Uh, remember that we have to, we need to have models for everything, right? So contacts are almost, are never points, right? So it doesn't matter how small it is, it's always gonna be a small patch. But sometimes we model um, uh, contacts with points just for simplicity. But in the case of the object with the ground, um, the, extent, the contact is extended enough that the point is not sufficient to get a, um, a realistic model for the interaction. And then you need to consider an extended contact. That's what I mean by a patch contact. And then a principle of maximal dissipation, um, right? So I'm pushing in this direction and the object could do many things could move forward or could start rolling to one side or to the other side. And we need a law, um, so the system is underdetermined. I would not be able to simulate it. And we need a law that says, uh, that decides what's actually gonna be the motion of the object. And that law is what we call the principle of maximal dissipation, which says that the object will move trying to maximize the dissipation of energy through friction. Um, in practice, what that means is that um, conveniently, the motion of the object will be given by a twist, by a vector that is orthogonal to this limit surface, to whatever the friction range we have. Okay, so we have a set of equations, right? Newton plus your choice of which constraints, either these ones, these ones, or these ones, uh, friction with the ground. Some of these constraints are unilateral constraints. Some of these constraints are equality constraints. Um, and maximal dissipation. And if you want, here is a visual representation of how these constraints are working, right? So the friction with the ground, um, we said that if the object is sliding, sliding, the friction with the ground is gonna be somewhere in the uh, surface of this ellipse, right? I don't know where exactly, but it has to be there, so that's a constraint, right? Algebraically, this would mean the friction is gonna satisfy this, the equation of this ellipse. Right? That would be one algebraic constraint in your system of equations. Then the force from the pusher on the object 
it's going to be in the friction cone, right? Um, and then because we're assuming quasi-static interaction, the resultant, whatever happens with the system, has to be in the intersection between these and this, right? So the force from the uh, pusher has to be equal to the force from the ground with negative sign, right? So the intersection between these two things is the set of possible solutions to the set of equations here, graphically. And if we apply principle of maximal dissipation, remember the motion has to be orthogonal to whatever point we are here, which means that at the end we have a sort of cone of possible motions for the object, what we call the motion cone. And this is just a representation of that motion cone depending on where the pusher is. So this is the direction along which the point and the object will move either anywhere inside this cone, depending on where the pusher is. It cannot move anywhere else based on our models. Okay, so that's something that you can use to simulate the system, for example. But you can also use it to control it, right? So imagine that this is your nominal trajectory. You wanna get, get the object to move straight. Uh, remember, it's a difficult thing to do because it's unstable, right? The object might rotate to the right or the left. Um, and then we wanna build a local controller that stabilizes the position of this object around its nominal trajectory. Something like this, right? So where uh, the pusher is here and it slides up to be able to rotate the object down and as it goes down, it sort of slides down again to get to the center so that it can push it straight. How do we come up with plans like this where um, we have to figure out not just what is the motion of the pusher and the f interaction forces, but also which mode we want the pusher to be in at every instant in time. Um, sort of a very common approach these days to control these systems is called model predictive control. It's basically the idea, if you haven't heard about it, that I can simulate the system forward and I'm just gonna search over the possible inputs to my system to see which forward simulation looks more like what I would like it to look like, right? I would like it to look like something like this. I would like the object to end up in this line and get there as soon as possible. So I build a cost function that my search algorithm is gonna be minimizing to find this trajectory. And I wanna find this trajectory 100 times per second. Right, so I wanna find this trajectory of, let's say, the next 50 steps, the next 50 actions to execute. Uh, I'll execute one of those 50, and then I'll replan uh, 100 times per second. And that's sort of the basis of model predictive control. Um, okay, so I build this, a cost function like this, where this is basically the last state of my system. I put a cost. Um, because I want it to be here. And then I sort of minimize also the distance between the state and the nominal trajectory along the trajectory, but with a different weight. And I try to minimize the effort of the controller. So this is a very standard cost function for a controller. And subject to many constraints, right? Remember, all the actions that I'm searching for, X is the state of where the object is, and U are the actions, so the forces that I'm exerting on the object are subject to many constraints. Either you have to be here, and then you have to satisfy these constraints, or here and satisfy these ones, or here and this one, and always it has to satisfy Newton's equation, this is the linearized version, and the principle of maximal dissipation and all the constraints that we explained. Um, and it has to deal with hybridness, right? So it has to choose when, uh, for example, that first it wants to slide up, then stick, then slide down, and then stick. And this, is, this sort of makes this problem computationally very difficult, right? So doing it in brute force where you try all possible set of um, um, modes for every instant, right? So if there are three modes and there's like 50 uh, time steps, that would be like three to the 50 possible sequence of modes. Try the, trying them all would take the, the age of the universe, right? Um, so that's impossible. Um, and there are ways in which people try to solve this problem, and I'm not gonna get into that, but I'm just gonna give you the key words of how standard ways to do this, using complementarity constraints, which 
are the kind of constraints that are used for simulation, uh, mostly. Um, becomes very slow. Or mixed integer programming, which is sort of a type of programming that allows you to uh, search for um, variables that are continuous and some that have discrete values at the same time. Uh, it, it becomes possible. But then the, the most standard way that people do it these days is by sort of um, having, discrete, having decisions, either learning offline, um, which are like sensible transition modes. Like if the object is here, it would make sense to first slide up and then stick and then slide down and then stick again. Um, and if the object were to be on another side, it would be sensible to have a certain type of sequence of modes. Learning those modes offline and then online just optimize the velocities conditioned to certain modes. That's sort of the most standard approach these days. And then you can do things like this, right? Where uh, it doesn't matter what it is, sort of it makes those decisions in real time. So if you perturb it, it just goes back. And um, what's nice about it is that, well, you can start perturbing the system in different ways. I'm perturbing the center of mass of the object here which was a variable in my model, but it still works because it replants at 100 hertz, which means that if there's a small error, it will correct for it. Or I can change the coefficient of friction of the ground. This is um, polyurethane, so much more rubbery, so higher friction, but it still works, right, because it's replanting very fast. Um, just an example following a different trajectory. Um, yep, question. Yes. Yep. So um, th that's a great question. And that's by large is still a, an unsolved problem, like in general, right? So there are ways for a system like this, which is quite simple, there are ways to do it. Um, like, there are, way, there are ways to solve this problem fully in the sense that you would get optimal transitions, but it's not fast enough to, um, to execute it in real time, like the, at 100 hertz, but you can execute it uh, offline. And then you can sample different poses of where the object would be and see what would be the optimal transition, a sequence of modes uh, from, I don't know, 50,000 different um, poses of the object, and then just learn a function that interpolates between those. Um, for systems that are more complex, that are still even difficult to sort of find the optimal modes offline, it's still by large an unsolved problem. And in most cases, the transitions are imposed just through intuition. Like, for example, for locomoting machines, for machines that, uh, that work, um, the sequence of hybrid transitions uh, many times is explicitly written by hand. First, I want to put your feet on the ground and then lift the other one and then put here and then reach a kinematic constraint, maybe the end of my knee so that you can exert my force and then lift and then put again. And then what is optimized are the velocities given the assumptions on all those uh, uh, transitions. Um, there are other ways to do it, like following human demonstrations, for example. You could do planning, but for if the if the system is complex enough, even planning, it's difficult to do it offline, right? Because um, there are many decisions that hybrid decisions that the planner would need to find. So. Uh, finding optimal solutions from a planning perspective, it might still take hours or days or years, depending on the system. Not for this one. This one is the simplest problem, so we can still investigate it. So in this case, can you elaborate a bit more about what exactly is being learned? Um, so here, and the, in the execution, um, everything is optimization, right? So. Um, but the, the sequence of, let me go back to this slide. 
the sequence or the, the oracle that says, well, you are going to optimize the velocities, how much you have to slide up and how much you have to push and how much you have to slide down. Uh, but the oracle that tells you um, for these first time steps, you're going to slide up. I don't know how much, but you're going to slide up. And for these next time steps, you're going to stick. I don't know how much, but you're going to stick. And then slide down and then stick. The oracle that tells you, depending on the, uh, the configuration, what is the sequence of transition modes, um, that's something that um, for this system can be optimized in real time using mixed integer programming um, at something like 25 hertz if I remember correctly. But if you want to go beyond that, or if you want to solve, attack a more complex problem, you can't do it in real time. So what we do is we do it offline. We sort of say, if the object were to be here, what would be the optimal sequence of uh, transitions? Not the velocities, but just the sequence, the transition modes. And we do it for many positions, and then we learn a function that rem sort of gives an intuitive idea of what should be these transition modes. And we treat it as a classification problem, right? If you look at the, in the input space, what are the modes that he wants to do? It's, these are like continuous regions, right? So there's a point where there's a boundary, and then he wants to switch to another one, and then he wants to switch to another one. So it's, it's pretty much a classification problem. Yep? Yep. Um, the model doesn't change, doesn't need um, many changes. So here, um, Newton's law is the same one, right? If, let's say if it's a circle. Um, the interaction between the, uh, the pusher and the object is the same one, right? It's just Coulomb's friction law and just, it's just instantaneous and local to that point. The friction with the ground, that will be slightly different, right? So the model of the friction between a circle and the ground is a slightly different than a square with the ground. Um, but that's not the most dramatic change. The most dramatic change is that um, to when you slide, um, if you slide sort of in a line, you would separate from the object, right? So uh, you would need to slide, uh, you would need a description of the perimeter of the object and see which velocities would induce penetration, which velocities it would induce separation. Right, so um, a constraint that I didn't write here is the no penetration constraint, right? Like I, if I move my pusher forward, the object has to move forward at the same velocity so that I'm not penetrating it. And um, if I move to the side, um, depending on the geometry of the object, uh, the pusher would separate from the object or would continue in contact, right? So that modeling of the kinematics of the um, intersection or collision between the, or the distance between the pusher and the object is what is captured by the, ge what the geometry is capturing. But from the perspective of the, the physics, it's pretty much the same, very similar. Yep. Yeah, great question. Um, I, I mean, it, I think it's a combination of uh, several factors, right? So one is that the model is deficient, right? So um, it's interesting to see that when you run a system like this, it makes mistakes, but most of the time these mistakes are consistent, right? So the next time that it goes around, it will go along a very similar line, right? Um, and um, it's either because um, 
the perception system that is telling the robot where it is all the time um, has a bias here, has an offset here, which I doubt it because it's a bicon system, or because the model is significantly different here so that the nominal trajectory that we're following, actually it's not good enough to follow the trajectory that we wanted to follow, right? It's very likely that the friction here is very different, is rather different from here, for example, right? This is probably not the, a great material to do these experiments. It has fibers, so the friction is very anisotropic. Um, so you can see things like that. Five minutes, okay. So um, this is sort of the, uh, maybe the part that I like the most of, the, of this talk. Um, now the, the second example, you'll see that we're building up from the first one, but now in a more realistic or more useful scenario. Um, we wanna pick up this object and uh, in an industrial setting it's very common to wanna change the grasp on the object because you wanna do a certain assembly or you wanna place it in a certain way. Uh, so how do we go from here, from, from here to here? This is what we call in hand manipulation or uh, robot dexterity. How do we change this grasp? And something that we've been working on for some time um, is um, figuring out how to execute those motions, right? So um, a different um, story, a different version of the same story, I wanna pick up this key and put it here into MIT, but I don't have clearance to do it, right? So how does the robot so I get around it? Well, um, it's pretty simple. It picks it up and then, right? <laughs> you have a black box that solves the problem. Um, What's in this black, black box? So let me, it's probably easier to see what's going on from the perspective of the, uh, of the gripper, right? So now we wanna see a video of the same action, but what the gripper is seeing. Um, it turns out that we built a gripper that has a third finger. And it's a third finger that is very dexterous. It's probably the most dexterous finger that uh, any gripper has ever had. It can move in six dimension up and down, laterally, and rotational. It can move very fast and precise. Um, so this is what you saw in the previous video. The robot goes to pick up the T, and then we engage the third, the third finger, and it just manipulates the T uh, to where it's supposed to be. But, oh wait, wait a second. It's floating, that finger? But it gets the job done. Right, so what is that finger? Well, it, that finger is nothing else than a finger attached to the environment, right? But when you record it from the perspective of the gripper, it just looks like a third finger, right? So um, you can use the environment uh, to your advantage. When I pick up, and that's something that we do uh, very often. I pick up an object and I just have it here, <laughs> or I rotate, or I do like this. Um, so if we have good mechanics models of the environment and we have an understanding of which forces we can get from it, then it just becomes another um, uh, a part of our uh, action space. Okay, so how do we model this problem from a mechanics perspective? What are the equations of motion that, um, that we want to, that we need to include? And I have, Five minutes, you said? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanna walk quickly over this. But I just want you to see that it's almost exactly the same problem that we solved before, right? Now we have an object that is held by a gripper uh, with two fingers, and we have a pusher, which is the environment that is pushing the object around. Uh, while before we had an object that it was laying on a ground, the ground is like these finger contacts, and there was a pusher that was pushing it. The only difference is that gravity was maintaining before the object in contact with the ground, while now gravity might be pushing the object outside from the gripper. But this contact here is equivalent to the ground, and this pusher here is equivalent to this pusher. While in this case it was a quasi-static problem, it was always in equilibrium, in this case it becomes quasi-dynamic because um, sometimes the object might fall. Right? 
if I don't have enough friction force in my fingers, the object might fall. So I need to account for that. It's not always in equilibrium. Okay, so um, we go through the same derivations, but now we need to include gravity. And now um, the pusher friction force, we, might, we can model it by discretizing it as different sev uh, several point pushers that each one has to respect uh, Coulomb friction. And they all have to move as, uh, as a rigid body. So we need to impose kinematic constraints between them so that they move um, together. And we have the friction, which before was with the ground, now is with the fingers, with each one of the fingers. Uh, but we can also model as a limit surface as before. And we have the principle of maximal dissipation. So it's pretty much the same type of constraints. And this is how you model most of these problems in manipulation. You just keep stacking all the necessary constraints. Um, similarly, if you want to look at graphically, this is now the set of forces that we can exert with the pusher. And this is the set of motions we can exert on the object, what we call the motion cone, um, which then now, before I showed how it can be used in a control setting, it can also be used in a planning setting. Um, for example, instead of doing trajectory optimization as before, we can use sampling-based planner, right? So we use these motion cones to see what velocities we can exert on the object, and we just keep sampling, sampling, sampling until we get to the goal configuration to do something like this. If you want to go from this grasp to this one, um, there's a sequence of pushes. And each one of those pushes is explained by the mechanics, that by the equations that we saw before, right? So there's a dynamic transition model for each one of those actions that we're going to sample. Um, but we can push the object on different sides, so that, inc that induces hybridness. And then we use sampling-based uh, sampling planner, RRT star, to be able to figure out those sequences, to do things like this. If you want to go from here to here, well, it figures out that it has to first push in that direction. and then push down. Or if you want to do this regrasp, uh, it figures out that it can do it just with one single uh, continuous push. This continuous push is a sequence of like 15 very small pushes, right? It's a sampling-based planner. Um, so that now we can do things like this. We can pick up the object, uh, roll it, and push it against a fixture, and then pivot it, and then it becomes straight as we wanted initially. OK, so just to finish, just to remember, how do we get robots to do this? I don't know yet, but we will figure it out. Um, but to me, it's clear that we need mechanics of frictional contact, right? So we need robots to have an understanding of what they can do through friction. And uh, we need robots to do planning and control with those models. Um, so that they can exploit hybridness and reactivity. And they also need more things which I haven't talked about. Uh, one of them is sex sensing and perception, right? So the models that we use, as you were saying, are very um, noisy, or they don't capture many of the things that are going to happen in reality, like the formation. Um, so we, I probably, we probably need vision and tactile sensing to be able to close the loop. And then the hardware has to be compatible with the task, right? So there's a, a big component here of design and integration so that all these things can play together. Uh, but the key idea is to embrace contact explicitly, right? Not just intuitively as when we were planning for grasps for the Amazon Robotics Challenge. Just bring your gripper here and close, close your eyes and close the gripper. But being more explicit about embracing uh, contact forces. So you can do things like this. Sequential planning. Uh, you want to pick up all those objects. So you first maybe have to separate them so that then you can pick them up. Or we need tactile sensing, right? So um, we need sensors in the fingertips that give us information about the contact forces and the geometry that we are contacting to do things like this. You want to pick up that nut but that's not the right grasp that you want, so you tumble it, and then you pick it up. Or you're grasping an object, and um, you know that you realize that that's not a good grasp, so 
you change the grasp so that then when you lift it, it's in a more stable position. Or to do assembly, for example, by using contact forces. Or, oh, PT is not playing. Well, to play Jenga, for example, right? So j playing Jenga is an example of, of a game that unless you have an understanding of force and what it means for forces to reach a certain level and uh, mastery of friction, it's impossible to play, right? You play by touching. Um, sorry, I don't know what's going on with the video. So that you can do things like that, yeah. All right, thank you. Since we're about to have lunch and people have asked a lot of questions, um, I guess we'll take two questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, anybody who has some additional questions? This right here. Excuse me, why do we need to do this preemptive proofing at phi? So we need to model the gravity so we cannot do all this stuff on the ground? Yeah, you can do it in the ground. And, um, I'm in Sorry, you can do it on the ground and uh, sometimes it's more convenient, right? For example, gravity, uh, it becomes invariant to gravity, right? Um, it just happens that sometimes the ground might be occluded or you might wanna have a fixture somewhere else so that you have more clearance or I don't know. Um, but just to show that you can do it both on the ground and, uh, and in, vertic in the vertical plane. Yep. Last question. Uh, so how do the proof be improved between the tactile sensors? Tactile sensors. Yeah, so if you can sense the force distribution, and that's actually something that we're sort of actively working on, um, you can use that information in real time to get a more accurate model of the mechanics, and then do it, um, make your model more realistic. And you can also use the tactile sensor to close the loop, the way, same way that we're doing it with the, uh, with the planar pushing. These executions, by the way, the ones in the, in the last part of the talk were open loop, right? So, we had to design actions that were robust because we didn't have the right amount of sensing to be able to understand whether the part was deviating from. So we had to limit the kind of motions that to what we call the stable prehensile pushing, um, which I didn't have to, time to get into, so that they were robust enough to, um, to be reliable. But that limits the set of actions that you, can that you can execute. If you had sensors, you could do it in a more efficient way, for example more reliable. I'm gonna sneak in one last question, yeah. which, is, which is when you add in multiple manipulators and you have concurrency, has that been examined much and does that shape the problem? Um, I mean, it has been examined in point problems, right? So um, coordination between the arms so that they avoid each other or they don't uh, coll collide on each other. There's been some work. But not to or improve grasping. Not uh, coordination, for example, for lifting an object and uh, moving it so that they don't fight each other and they collaboratively. But in terms of using several manipulators to lift or to grasp a particular object, not that much, yeah. Good, well thank you very much. Yeah. So feel free to ask more questions and uh, we'll see you back at one o'clock. All right.